one of the most important skills in meditation practice is learning how to develop both a clear center, a strong focal point, and full body awareness. You've got to have both. The focal point without the full body awareness is hard to maintain continually. You can maintain it when everything is quiet and there are no disturbances, but as soon as there's the least bit of disturbance, you lose it. And it's a very blind kind of concentration. You focus just on one spot and you tend to blot out everything else. And it can feel very centered, very secure while you're in it. But it makes discernment difficult. Full body awareness without a center, though, doesn't have the depth, doesn't have the, the heft of a centered concentration. It can get very vague and sloppy. So you've got to learn the, the skill of balancing the two. And in the course of your meditation, you'll find that sometimes the, the emphasis goes more towards the center, and other times goes more towards the fullness. But you want to work at both. And John Lee gives the analogy of cutting roads through a wilderness. If you want to improve the communication, improve the transportation through the wilderness, you've got to cut lots of roads, and then it's very easy for everybody to get to everybody else. And nowadays we don't like cutting th roads through wilderness. We think the wilderness should be left alone. But in his day there was a definite need in Thailand for more roads. And so think of your body as needing roads. You want everything to be connected. This way it makes it easier to develop that balance between the center and the full body awareness. So at first you have to go through the body. Notice where are the blockages. Before you look at the blockages, you first you've got to get at least one spot that feels good. It maintains a steady sense of fullness all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. And you'll notice that it depends on how long the breath is. Sometimes if you breathe out or your out-breath is too long, you start squeezing your spot, so that's not good. So as soon as you sense that you're squeezing it, stop and breathe back in. Until it feels ready to breathe back out again. Try to maintain that sense of your full, comfortable center. And then start exploring the rest of your body to see if you can have that sense of fullness and ease in other parts as well. And notice where you don't have it, where parts of the body seem to be missing, or they're tense or tight and blocked. And you do your best to work through the blockages. Just think of them. As penetrable, that you can make a connection, say, say there's a blockage in your arm. Focus on the part above the blockage and the part below the blockage. How do you connect them? Where do they connect already? There must be some connection, otherwise your arm would be paralyzed. Why do the muscles feel tightened there? Can you consciously loosen them so you can connect things up? And do this throughout the whole body so there's a sense of connection. Once you've got that sense of connection, then you can try settling down one spot and see if you can maintain that one spot and feel connected throughout the whole body from that spot. In the beginning, you might want to try the points that John Lee mentions in his method two. The middle of the forehead, the palate, the base of the throat, the tip of the sternum, point just above the navel.
these are the basic spots that you might want to try first. But find if you don't find that they work, we'll see what does work. And try to maintain that balance of being focused and still in your one spot, and yet feeling a sense of connection throughout the whole body. It's like having eyes on all sides of your body. Instead of just looking at one thing, you're looking all around. The advantage of this kind of meditation is that once you have that sense of the all-around awareness, it can withstand distractions because they come into your range. And you can hold them in that range if you need to hold them, or you can sim simply let them go through. Much better than if you're just on one spot, because if you're on one spot and that's it, and you move from that one spot, the concentration is destroyed. But this way you've got a sense of full range that you can hold on to, that you can stay settled in, where you feel at ease, you feel at home. And it's like a sound wave coming through your home. The sound may come through, and you know there's a sound, but it doesn't destroy your home. So on the one hand, the advantage is that the concentration is a lot more solid. It's the kind of concentration you can carry throughout the day. And secondly, it primes you for discernment. Because the whole issue of discernment is, what is the mind doing? And if you just look at one spot, you miss all the other things that are happening around that spot. Because often it's the things that are happening around. Those are the issue. And you can apply this either in the concentration itself or when you've come out of concentration, looking at things in terms of the five aggregates. In the concentration, the Buddha recommends developing the ability to step back from your concentration a bit. The image he gives is of a person sitting who's watching a person lying down, or a person standing watching a person sitting. You look at them, you're above them. You can see what they're doing. After all this, state of concentration is a form of what they call bhava, or becoming. It's a state of being. And the state of being is usually focused on something. There's a craving, there's a delight, there's a there's an attraction to one thing. That becomes the focus for a whole sense of who you are and the sense of the world around you. And you want to be able to watch that process. So being able to step back from that one spot and look at it from another perspective enables you to see how it's all put together. And then you can start analyzing what you've got in this state of concentration. Where is the form? Where is the feeling? In other words, look at it in terms of the five aggregates. It's not just a spot. There's going to be a sense of form, and there's a feeling of pleasure or equanimity. And then there's the perception that keeps you there. And then there's the running commentary. This is sankara, or fabrication. And that can exist on many levels. In the beginning of concentration, when you're actively working through the body, it's pretty blatant. On the more subtle levels of concentration, it goes more into the background. But there are intentions going on. There has to be an intention that maintains that concentration all the time. And there's going to be a perception. So uniting that intention and the perception. That's a process of fabrication. You want to look for that. Again, sometimes this involves having eyes in the back of your head, or eyes on different sides of your body. In other words, it's not going to be right where you thought it was. It's certainly not going to be right at the spot of the concentration. It's going to be hovering around. This is why you need that all-around awareness to see it. And then there's a sense of awareness itself, consciousness, vijnana. That's in there, too. And you want to be able to observe these things if you're going to get any insight out of the concentration while you're in the concentration. The same principle applies to focusing on things when you leave 
the intensity of strong concentration. For example, when there's a physical pain, you want to be able to take it apart. And you realize that the suffering is not the pain. It's the suffering is what you do around the pain. So again, you need this all-around awareness to see what's going on all around. Like that analogy of taking a camera in to see the animals of the savanna. You focus at the watering hole, but you don't just sit there taking pictures of the watering hole. You want to be able to see the animals all around the watering hole. So the pain is the watering hole. You take it apart. What's in the pain? What's around the pain? Because that's where you see a lot of the suffering being created. First there's the form of the body. And you have to realize the form of the body is not the pain. We tend to glom the two together. You have a pain in your knee, and it seems to be right there in the shape of the knee. And the pain gets equated with the knee. But your sense of the form of the, the knee and the pain, those are actually two different things. The form is made out of the properties of earth, water, wind, and fire. None of those are pain. The pain is a way to not, a feeling. And if you can learn to make a distinction between the two, you see that the actual feeling comes and goes, moves around, whereas the knee just sits there. The blood flows through, you move it a little bit, but the actual form of the body and the sensation of, say, physical pain are two separate things. You want to be able to see that distinction. You're trying to take the suffering and cut it up into manageable bites. So instead of being one huge lump, it turns into little pieces of gravel. And then as you're looking at it, you begin to realize there's also perceptions going on around the pain. Some of them just say, pain, 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 or whoops, now it's moving here, now it's going there. Sometimes there's a mental image that goes along with that. You want to be able to see that in action because you begin to realize that the way you label the pain is going to have a huge influence on both the actual physical sensation of the pain and the extent to which it's causing suffering for the heart. It can even happen that as you cut that perception, once you actually see the part of the mind that's commenting on the pain, saying things like that, or pain, or what it looks like, if you can cut that perception and stop repeating it, the pain will actually disappear. It goes zip right into the heart, it disappears, and you realize that the suffering all came out of the heart was projected onto that spot in the body. That can happen. Other times, though, I mean, you cut the perception and the physical pain is still there, but the mind feels a lot less burdened by it, because you're not trying to carry it. Sometimes that happens. We feel that if we don't surround the pain with our commentary on it, it's going to take off and spread everywhere. And that fear is what makes us hold it. But actually the holding is, is the weight on the mind. Then there are the narratives that go along with the pain. This is the sankara, fabrication. You think about how long the pain has been there, how much longer it's going to be there, you're wondering why you're putting up with this pain, or why the forces of the world are making you ill right now, if that's what the problem is, com the pain is coming from. And again, if you have this all-around awareness developed, you can see the narratives as they flit around in the mind. And again, you can see the connection between the narrative and the actual level of suffering that you feel. And then there's the consciousness, the awareness of all these things. You want to make that as all-embracing as possible. So you can see the whole picture, and not just one point. It's this all-embracing awareness that allows you to see connections, particularly connections between events. That's what the word samudhiya and the origination of suffering means, something that arises at the same time. It arises together, disappears together. 
you see the perception arising and there's a greater sense of burdensomeness, okay, you realize that that burdensomeness has come from the perception. And if your focus is so totally narrow to one point, you're not going to see any connections at all. You just see your one point. So you want a concentration that's more inclusive. Some people say that concentration has to be exclusive and mindfulness is inclusive. Never, the Buddha never said anything like that at all. Concentration is full body awareness. Centered, but full body. And the skill is learning to keep the two of them together. It makes the concentration more solid and opens the way for discernment to arise. Because your awareness is all around. You'll see connections of what's happening all around. And it's only in that way that insight can arise.